Um, again, as you trickle in, use the chat function to introduce yourself. I am Marian Adake and I run digital events here at AllRays. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, many of you may know that this is a webinar and so there's two functions. There's the chat function, which again, for those trickling in, introduce yourselves in the chat, where you're from, what you do. And there's also a Q&A uh, chat box. Uh, so as questions come up, please feel free to use the Q&A box to drop in your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar for you today, and it will be accessible via the AllRaise website. And there also will be additional resources um, following this event, and you can find those resources on the website as well. And the breakdown for today's agenda is we'll have about 40 minutes of Camille walking us through different strategies and best practices, and we'll close out with 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. And without further ado, I will introduce our speaker today. So Cam Camille Nismich, uh, founder of Instant Equilibrium LCC, is a leader in providing strategic advisory to emerging and high growth companies. As a result of her two degrees at Dell Technologies, she has developed a proven three-step framework that has driven over 65 million in cost savings and 1 billion in sales pipeline. Camille's deep expertise spans finance, communications, and marketing, and has led her to be referred to as the closest thing to unicorn in a Fortune 500 setting, as well as a digital guru. She holds an MBA from the College of William and Mary's Mason School of Business. She's a former certified treasury professional and is a current member of the US Women's Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much, Camille, for joining us today and for everyone on the call. Thanks so much for having me. So I think I need to have power to share and then we will go ahead and get started. Oh, I see another member of the William Mary tribe here. Okay, you should have, um, it should be opened. Uh -oh. Let me go ahead and share if you can let me see that. Uh, can everybody see the slides? Marian is thumbs upping me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marian, for that introduction. Yes, I am super passionate about helping female founders and funders. And so I am in the absolute right place here. Thank you all for your time. I'm going to dive right in because and sometimes I talk fast. I know there's a portion where I will need to probably slow down for many of you. And then also I want to make sure that I get to your questions. So I want to dive right in with that. Um, I know that everybody was telling me where they were, but I'm also going to ask you another question of, in a few moments. So get ready for that. Get ready to get in the chat. But anyway, as Marion mentioned, I am talking about cash flow is queen. That is one of the key topics that is core and near and dear to my heart, both from my corporate past as well as what I do with my clients now. And in this training, what I really want to do is I want you to start to think about and really shift your thinking about your financials in your business. I know that many of the startup founders that I work with and that I talk to often think about profitability and they don't necessarily focus on cash flow. And so I want to kind of shift that mindset today really unpack why cash flow is the absolute most important measure in your business. I want to help you understand how to manage it. And then I want to help you understand how to not only manage it, but then use it to scale profitably in your business so that you, in fact, can beat the odds of survival of a startup. I know we've all seen the data. We'll talk about it here a little bit in a moment, but I want you to be armed with the information that you need to propel your business forward. Go to the next slide. So I want to start off with a quote that really kind of encapsulated what I did in my corporate career. As Marion mentioned, I spent a couple of decades at Dell. I'll talk about that here in a moment. But I really learned early on what the culture was at that company and how I could then later, many decades in the future, apply that in my own business. And I wanted to kind of ground us in this quote from essentially the man who was my boss for <laughs> the better part of 20 years, Michael Dell, who talked about after they emerged as a startup and then really kind of hit a wall, the quote says, like many companies, we were always focused on our profit and loss statement, but cash flow was not a regularly discussed topic. It was as if we were driving along watching only the speedometer when in fact we were running out of gas. And that really kind of punctuates a lot of the pitfalls that I myself see when I'm working with my clients is so focused on profitability and really not really thinking about cash flow. And so that is the mindset that I took as I went into that company way back for the first time in 1999 and really, like I said, 
it flowed throughout my journey there and now impacts how I work with my clients today. So you're probably wondering, okay, you talked a little bit about that Camille, but why should I listen to you on this particular topic? Well, like I said, two decades at Dell, one of the things that we learned, um, I started there in the finance organization, like Marion mentioned, I worked across the company in my time there, but really one of the things that we always talked about was how do we have the right balance and the right mix, not only in our cash flow picture, but how do we manage and balance liquidity, profitability, and growth. And I'll unpack that here in a moment, but that was really kind of the grounding principle and the guiding principle that we all lived by. And so some of the things that I did in my time there in, in the name of managing positive cash flow so that we could balance those three things was everything from walking away from vendors and deals that just didn't make sense, killing products that sometimes were just about to launch and then we scrapped them, ones that had recently launched and didn't even make it a year we would scrap, um, invested millions of dollars in overnight transactions. So one of the things that they did was they would manage their cash position such that they were cash flow positive. And then I would make decisions on how much of that are we going to invest overnight so that we can get an overnight return on the, those dollars. Um, reduced headcount, which obviously is going to come up when you're in a large corporation, negotiated millions of dollars in partner marketing. And that is often when we get to the levers conversation, a lever that you can pull at any size business. Um, and then ultimately spearheaded a program that delivered a billion dollars in sales pipeline. So I have worked across many of the different areas that you all may play in, in terms of operations, finance, marketing. And so we are going to dig into how you can do the very same for your business. So I want to pause for a moment and I want to ask you in the chat and I'm going to get back to the chat. A lot of you, as you were joining, you were saying, hey, am I, I'm a founder, I'm a venture capitalist, whatever it is. So let me know in the chat both what you are in terms of what your role is today, if you are a founder, if you are a funder, but then also I want to know are, if you are a founder, are you raising, have you raised recently, are you bootstrapping, want to get a sense for who I'm talking to and what will be most valuable to you in this conversation. Sometimes with Zoom webinar, I lose the chat and somehow I can't seem to locate it. Let's see if I can find it. It went. Camille, I have it up here as well. Yeah, okay. So founder, venture backed. We have currently raising okay. uh, team member helping a raise uh, for an analysis startup. Founder, founder, haven't raised yet. Bootstrapping, 100K in investment, convertible note. Founder, bootstrapping, um, have raised. So definitely a mixed bag. Nice mix. I love it. Thank you so much for that. For some reason, I have lost the chat, so I may have to come back to you because it, oh wait. No worries. Sometimes Zoom webinar will just put it in this really strange place. I think I, let me see it. Oh yeah, there it is. And I see it's in a, it was hidden. Okay, got it. Perfect. I'm going to put it off to the side here so that I can get back to it next time. All right. So thank you for that. That's really helpful. Gives me an idea. Um, I may have to adjust pace, but that's okay. So again, the, the main takeaway that I want you to understand is that really cash flow is what I like to call queen. Everybody has heard the phrase, oh, cash flow is king, cash flow is king, but really it is actually queen. And the reason why is you have to think about cash flow from the standpoint of the power and the power of it is in the movement of the cash, right? It is a tool in your business, much like the queen is the most powerful piece on the chessboard, the power of that piece is in how she can move. She can move diagonally. She can move side to side. She can move forward and back. She can move in any direction in the way that is going to create the best outcome. And that's exactly what cash flow does in your business, right? It is, a, it is a dynamic feature of your business. When you are moving cash, you have a multitude of options for growth at your disposal. And it really is at the heart of, so you, again, just told me that you've got venture capitalists, you've got people who have raised. When you are thinking about funding in your business, what a venture capitalist cares about is how are you going, how are they going to put money into your business engine and you're going to put returns back out of that engine, right? And so that is the flow. That is the flow from them to your business and from your business through your engine out into the marketplace and then to deliver returns to them, right? So it's all about the flow and that is why it is an absolutely important thing that you need to think about. And so one of the things that I want to do now is I really want you to understand what are the tools that you use to manage that cash flow. All right, so let's talk just really quickly about the reasons why startups fail. I think it's important because, you know, we all we all see the headlines, we all understand what happens when, you know, companies don't make it. But regardless of whatever funding that you have, 
those problems can come into play and, and largely all, arguably all of the reasons why, the main reasons why um, businesses fail can be tied back to cash flow in some way. But some of the really big ones that you see here is, you know, 30% said, hey, we ran out of cash. And that is what I'm going to help you prevent in the presentation today when I teach you these things. Um, if you look on that same chart, even pricing cost issues, which come into some of the decision making around how you're using cash in your business. And then if you were to look at that full report, things like, um, you know, I didn't do the right pivot or I didn't have any financing or there was no investor interest. All of those things tie back to cash flow in your business. And so what we're going to do is we're going to unpack how you can approach these three strategies so that you can actually manage them the right way in your business. So I want to start off with that, you know, I want to resume <laughs> with another quote. And this one is really important because Chris Chocolo, he was not only an American businessman, he was also a politician. So kind of seeing two sides of, of the business cash flow picture. And his quote is, the fact is that one of the earliest lessons I learned in business was that balance sheets and income statements are fiction and cash flow is reality. I could not agree more because I say that all the time to my clients. You can be profitable on paper, but be forced to close your doors if you do not manage cash flow the right way. If you have negative cash flow and it goes on for too long, you and in fact can close your doors even if you're profitable on paper. So I want to help you avoid that. And I also want you to help you to kind of think strategically about it as opposed to from a place of, of fear, right? I want you to Think about cash flow in your business from a pace of power. And the way that you do that is to adopt some of these strategies that I want to talk to. So thinking back to that, what I said about my time at Dell and really managing liquidity. So how liquid is your business? How much can you generate cash on, on the top line? Are you profitable once you go through and you figure out, hey, I've, I've looked at my revenue. I've fulfilled all my expenses? Am I profitable at the end? But then also I want to grow because when you think about putting a dollar into your business, how are you then generating more dollars such that you're growing at the rate that you need to, particularly if you're someone who's gotten venture capital, that's going to be what 10 X that they're expecting. And so you need to think about, okay, how am I going to go deliver that? I've got a great product. I've got a, a market need that I'm serving. Well, the way that you do that is you manage three things strategically. You manage your sources of cash flow, and that can be your investments as well as your revenue. You're going to manage your uses. How are those dollars, you know, used and spent in your business in the right way? And then really the levers is how you go and pull different levers to make the decisions that are right for you at a particular period in time to sustain your growth. And so, you know, whether you're on the front end of getting money, whether you're looking for an additional raise or you're looking at debt, whatever that looks like, the liquidity, the profitability and growth is what's going to help you when you manage that the right way and you're positive from a cash flow standpoint, that is going to be how you meet your objectives. So I want to talk just for a moment about sources, right? Let's talk about sources. Again, when you think about what you see in the headlines, you know, you open your browser, you see what's happening in Inc and Fortune and who just got, you know, an award the value of that award. And so it, you get, to, you start to think about it. And, and I hear this in conversations with my clients, you start to think, oh, you know, I must be doing something wrong. You know, my raise wasn't that big, or I can't get into a conversation with this venture capitalist, or it's all venture capital, or, you know, why, why, why can't I get in conversations with angels? Or, you know, um, I don't hear about these grant programs, whatever it is, because all you see in those headlines are all of those, what I call the sexy, uh, you know, types of funding, right? And it's not to say that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think venture capital has done a lot and does a lot. And while we're putting, you know, we're putting more emphasis on, on leveling and getting to the place where we can level the playing field for women, sometimes I feel like those headlines do a disservice because what really happens when you really dig into how businesses are funded, it's not just the headlines. It's you know, people might be funding something with a side hustle. They might have internal funding that says, hey, I've got a cash engine in my business because I'm high margin in this one product line. It's going to fuel my growth into another market, into a, a new mis business model, whatever that looks like. You know, it might be that you worked for a startup, you got a severance package, and you are then putting that into a new business opportunity. It, it can be a variety of different things, but one of the things that I see is that how you manage that money, regardless of how the source comes in, is really what's important. And oftentimes, 
people don't think about what is truly the best source of funding. And so I want to pause and I want to ask you to tell me in the chat, what do you think the best source of funding is? And I think I do have the chat now, so I can see it. Anybody want to hop in the chat and tell me what they think the best source of funding is? Yes, Diane, Marcy are on it. It is exactly. Um, hybrid is what you see a lot, Mara, and, and I, we're going to talk about that here in a moment when I share an example with you, but really the best is sales from your customers because that's the one that you can really predict once you have your engine running um, and that's the one that's going to have the, the you know, the best implications in terms of delivering value not only to your investors, your shareholders, but, you know, yourself as the founder as well. So, um, so yes, trick question, sort of, but the best source is actually sales from your customers. Okay, so I want to share a little example, and this gets to the heart of the whole sources being really um, how hybrids are not the ones you see in the headlines, but it happens a lot. So I have a client, her name is Catherine Hover. She runs a community she runs a community locally here, but it's a it's a co working space with a twist. It's it's targeted toward female founders. It has a very she has a very fun kind of brand voice. Um, she does she kind of straddles the the line between social impact and building community with a co working space. Um, but she was a person who was a serial entrepreneur. She actually started with one of those paint and sip model businesses. Realized that she wanted to kind of go into different models. And so she said, hey, I'm going to open this cafe. And then she realized that, hey, I'm really doing a good job of making, helping people make connections, particularly women. They come to the cafe, you know, they have business conversations, they make deals. Maybe I should open a community, like a physical space to have a community. And so when I started working with her, one of the things that she was doing was she was saying, hey, I've got this cafe that's not making money. It's being funded largely, the, the loss of it is being largely funded by my paint and sip business. But really I have this vision to take what I know I've done and I've built traction around creating community for female business owners and, and professionals. And I wanna kind of project in and I wanna move into that business model. And so the first step was, yes, realizing that she's got this revenue generator that can actually fund expansion while she's cash flow negative on the cafe business, but really how does she then create traction in this new business model so that she can either grow organically or get access to funding. And so what she ended up doing was she, she we realized together that she had one of her greatest assets and her greatest pieces of traction was her email list. So it was relatively small, depending on what, what you want to compare her to, but it was mighty from the standpoint of an asset. So she was getting, she's still to this day, and it is, every time I say it out loud, it's amazing to me, but she gets between 35 and 50% open rates on her email, which is absolutely insane. I don't know how many of you, you know, manage an email list, hopefully all of you, but it is almost unheard of to have open rates at that level. And so not only does she get those open rates, but she's, like I said, she's got this really unique voice and the way that she creates community and the space for women. And she can turn on that sales engine very quickly just from her emails. And so what she was able to do is we, we put together a plan to not only um, think about the different pricing models she could have, but also how she could pivot. Obviously when the pandemic hit, she had to shift her delivery of services, if you would, obviously to virtual, but then also at that very same time, right as the pandemic was starting, she had made a commitment to open her second location. So then she was in a situation where she couldn't just use, you know, the other part of her business to fund the new location. She actually had to figure out how she was going to get attractive to an investor as well as drive the sales in her business. And so what she was able to do is she was able to kind of put those pieces together. We leveraged the asset in her, her ability to build community, the traction that she had with her email list, the way she could use the email list to drive actions take, you know, her customers taking action. And ultimately she was able to make the business attractive to an angel investor. She got her angel investment and actually just this week opened that second location of the co-working space and community space. So that is what I'm talking about when I say that really hybrid is more of what you see. It's what I see every day and working with my clients, but the key is to be able to pull the levers at the time that you need to pull them, which we will talk about here in a moment, so that you can then build that positive cash flow position for your business. 
And so ultimately, like I said, she, she not only opened the second location, but she sold out her fine founding memberships of her second location. So that, that means selling before the doors are open. That means in the midst of a pandemic, having a brick and mortar space where she was selling, you know, high value um, memberships. So, okay, I'm going to pause for a second after I go through this slide. So if you have questions about sources of capital, get those ready because I'm going to kind of hit those in a second. So one of the things that I want to talk about is every time you're managing that whole pyramid, you want to think about what are those critical questions that I need to answer and get answered in my business that will help me make my decisions. And I like to talk about the critical questions for sources, uses, and levers because that's the whole pyramid. From the sources standpoint, you really want to think about managing those sources in the short term, medium term, long term, and you think about them all in the categories of what does my sales and marketing look like, what are my operations and logistics looks like, and what does my financial plan and my projections look like. So from this, and I'm not going to read all of these to you, and don't worry about trying to take notes feverishly because you will get a copy of all the questions at the end of this presentation. Um, so don't worry about that, but just hear me out for just a moment. So let's think about critical questions around sales and marketing. Sources of cash flow. So oftentimes when you're thinking about being attractive either for debt, venture capital, sales growth, whatever, you're going to look at your customer set. That's just a, I mean, sorry, your uh, competitor set. That's just a natural thing to do. But one of the things that you always wanna have a lens to is, yes, what are they doing? Know what they're doing and what's working for them, but then how are you going to be different? Because I talk to a lot of my clients who are trying to chase what their competitors are doing and that does not always play out. So like I said about my client, Catherine, you know, have your own unique voice know that your people come to you because of you know you're speaking to their language and realize how you can leverage what a competitor might be doing but in the way that you are differentiated um, another thing that i like to talk about is when you're thinking about your your sources you need to tie it to your uses and we're going to talk about uses here in a minute but your current cash flows and the use of them is what gives you access to additional sources that makes sense. So let's just say that um, you have an angel investment and that might get you, you know, six months into your plan. And once you get into that plan and you're delivering on some of your objectives, maybe you're going to then go in and get a micro loan or get a working capital loan or whatever or line of credit or whatever that looks like. But the decisions that you make around that for first source and how you use them is what's going to open you up to the next source. And so, again, if you're going to be in a hybrid model like most businesses are, you really need to think of down the road instead of just being focused on today, if that makes sense. Um, so then in terms of your projections, and I recommend that everyone always have a financial model and a financial product projection. And oftentimes I'll hear people say, well, I don't understand spreadsheets or I don't understand accounting or I don't understand how to do that. I understand that you may not understand today, but that doesn't mean that you just can just put a line in the sand and say, I'm going to off, I'm going to outsource that to someone who's just going to manage it for me. And I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to let them, I'm going to focus on the product and I'm going to let them figure out the financial projections. That is a slippery slope. And honestly, that is a recipe for a bad outcome in your business. I've seen it way too many times. If you are the founder, it may not be your area of expertise, but you need to have a handle on your projections and you need to actually have a model that is constantly looking forward. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but I just kind of want to drive that point home. And so when you're thinking about those projections, one of the key things that you want to think about on the source side of things is, do I understand the lifetime value of a customer. We already agreed that the very best source of capital in your business is from sales, right? Okay, if I know that that is my best source, then I need to know what that lifetime horizon of the value of a customer looks like, and then I can go make some other decisions, if that makes sense. Okay, so I wanna pause here and I wanna see if there's any questions for sources of cash flow in your business. I'm looking at the chat. Yes, that was an amazing open rate. I just, <laughs> I, like I said, every time I say it out loud, it's just shocking to me because, and she, and she gets it consistently. Um, during Black Friday, um, you know, last calendar year, 
she got, oh my gosh, it was insane. Inside of the first two hours of sending out what was a sales email, much like everyone else, every other person who's selling thing or business who's selling things on Black Friday, she sent out. And within the first two hours, she had 55% open rate. And I thought, how? How is that possible? It's amazing. She does. She has her her, her customer voice dialed in really well. Okay, so I don't see any questions about courses, but I'm gonna press we on. We have one question, Camille, okay. um, from Fong. Um, in terms of hybrid sources of funding to start a business, how important is it for the founders to have skin in the game when approaching investors? Um, I'm gonna make an assumption on what you mean by skin in the game. Um, I don't know if that means like, hey, I've taken a 401k loan or whatever that looks like. Um, I think the biggest thing, aside from skin in the game, is just understanding that you've got an investor whose thesis is lined up with your business type. Um, but, you know, I, I, you can also think about skin in the game in terms of you've bootstrapped a little. You, and this is, you know, I think there were some pre-questions that I got, and I don't know if those people are going to be on live, but you probably need to bootstrap until you build traction. That's what I always say, because when you take that first investment, you know, like the floodgates are open at that point and you may be opening yourself up to multiple rounds and there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to know that going in. And so if you have bootstrapped to a point where you feel like, yep, I've got traction. I know that there is, you know, a market need for this because again, think back to that, that first slide, the largest thing that you saw there was there was no need for the product, right? And you don't want to be in a situation where you've got no need for a product or you don't have good par product market fit and you're going out to seek out investors because that's going to be um, a very frustrating activity, if that makes sense. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I do see one question from Anita that looks a little long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press on for just a moment. And if for some reason I don't come back to that um, in the main flow of the, the question, I mean, I'm sorry, the presentation, Anita, I will, I will hit it during Q&A, if that's all right, because that one's a little bit long, and it looks like I'm, it might take some time to read that. Okay, so again, again, I want to now kind of move into uses, because uses is where it's going to get a little bit intense in the presentation, and so I want to make sure that we get through that, and then also leave time at the end for questions. So, Jeff Bezos really nails it. And this is what's on the mind of investors. And we just talked a little bit about investors. So I think this point will be really important for you. And he says, percentage margins are not one of the things we are seeking to optimize. It's the absolute dollar free cash flow per share that you want to maximize. And if you do that by lowering margins, if we could do that, if you could do that, if you can do that by lowering margins, we would do that. So if you could take the free cash flow, that's something that investors can spend. Investors can't spend percentage margins. So again, it gets back to this idea of I can look really good on my income statement, but if I'm not delivering cash flow to the bottom line, I cannot meet the needs of my investors and I cannot sustain my business. Because, you know, margins, margins ultimately are the result of uses, right, in your business, right? Like I had my top line, I either got cash infusion or I made sales. I had my uses, I spent some money, and now that looks like, what does my margin look like? And margins, yes, are important, but you can't manage the uses to create positive cash flow if you don't think down the line past that to say, I have to be positive at the end. Because if we're eating everything up with the uses and I'm getting low margins, I, I've had almost like a short-sighted look at what my cash flow is, if that makes sense. And we're going to dig into cash flow here in just a minute. And we're going to dig into financial statements, but in a way that I think will be palatable for you. So first of all, I want to talk about uses and how cash works in your business. I always talk about business being an engine because it is. You put in some sort of dollar, there's some transformation that happens with those dollars, and then there's a result at the end. And hopefully there's, you know, a net income result, a cash balance result, and ultimately a retained earnings result, right? Which, which ultimately is helping out you, it's helping your investors, et cetera. So again, sources, we've talked about that. You're gonna bring in your cash balances from a previous period. You're gonna bring in new sales, hopefully recurring sales. You're gonna bring in whatever those cap capital contributions are. And once that business is in your, in that cash flow is in your business, it's in your engine. So then we're gonna use it. We're gonna transform it. If, if you've got some sort of physical product, we're gonna put, you know, 
intellectual property in it. Maybe you've got software, whatever that looks like. We're going to transform it in some way, and then we're going to deliver that to our customers, right? We've got some sort of operation that's going to figure out how cash is used in my business, transformed into that product or service, and then moved on. Another piece of the use, and this is one where I get so many questions around managing cash flow, and that's the acquisition costs, right? So it's not a cost of actually transforming into the product. It's actually an acquisition cost and that's sales and marketing, right? So people will say, hey, how, what percentage should I spend or, or how much in my budget? And we're going to get to that in a moment, but I want you to not get caught up in that because there's two types of uses, right? There's the transformation, transformation and delivery, but then there's also kind of what you do kind of back office. Um, and when you do that, you need to think again, into that future. So I was, I was saying, hey, do you know the lifetime value of a customer? You also need to know how much it costs for you to acquire a customer. And then, like I said, you have that result out the back end of the engine. I've got my net income. I'm building my cash reserves, hopefully, and I'm delivering retained earnings that ultimately are owed to shareholders and that sit on your balance sheet. All right, let's talk about financial statements. And again, I'm not gonna throw a bunch of statements out at you, but I want you to understand what's happening in them and the importance of cash flow to each of them. So your income statement, again, that's the one that so many people talk about. You're gonna start with your net income. That is a data point ultimately that is used in your cash flow statement. But first you have to create your, your income statement, right? You're gonna look at what sales did I make? What did I spend? What came out the bottom? Um, a lot of times people will get caught up in, well, I don't understand what EBITDA means. If you don't know what that means, it's earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. It's basically your operating income. And when, the, when investors are comparing your business to a like business, that's what they want to look at. They want to say, hey, what is the operational income of that business that sells widget X? And let me look at another business that sells widget X. How do they compare operationally, right? in terms of the operating income. And so it's important that obviously you have some sort of projection if you're not already making money in your income statement, but that is not where things end. You really wanna watch how cash flow flows through all of those statements and have a projection for all of them. Um, okay, so then the balance sheet, right? So you have your ending cash balance is the first line item on your balance sheet, but you actually can't even finish your balance sheet until you've done a cash flow statement, right? And so really what you want to think about is how do all, how does that transformation engine happen, right? I've got this cash position. I've got equity distributions that are going to play into my balance sheet. But ultimately I'm looking at, I have some things I own. I have some things I owe. They have to balance, but cash is a major component of all of them, right? And then we say, all right, we, we understand the income statement. Now we understand the balance sheet. Let's talk about the cash flow statement. And the cash flow statement is really, you've got net income. That's what it starts with. But how have I used that income to operate my business? What money was spent in the operations of it? What money was spent in the financing of any capital assets, which depending on what type of business we have on this call, you may or may not have any. Um, and then ultimately what happened with my financing activities. I mean, sorry, my investing activities, right? So did I get a capital contribution? If so, what does that picture look like? And when I figure out all of that net, that ending balance, whether it's positive or negative, and again, we're going for positive cash flow, obviously, that is a true and arguably the truest picture of how healthy your business is. And so that's why the, the financial statements are important, but why cash flow is the most important because it literally impacts all of them. Um, and I know that, okay, let's see. I see a quick question from Leslie. She said, is the in implication of this that lowering price, i.e. margin, is better trade-off to create more cash flow? Um, I, well, it's not, not always, and it's not a simple answer, Leslie, um, but the implicate, the main implication is you're, you're making decisions that manage your margins, obviously, always. Um, there may be times where your margins are thin, but then you have to figure out what else happens in your business engine that drives volume, for example, right, if your margin is low. So it's not as simple as just saying it's a better trade-off. You have to think about all of those things in conjunction with each other. 
Um, but you definitely don't want to constantly only be thinking about the margin and at the exclusion of the cash flow picture, if that makes sense, right? Because again, what you see in the headlines is, oh, margins, 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 but margins are important, but, but, but not at the expense of where your cash balance lands. Okay, awesome. All right, so now that we understand how cash flow plays into your financial statements, now I wanna to get to some of the things that you hear a lot about that oftentimes trip people up, that are sometimes confusing, that really say, hey, I now know what's either in my real financial statements or it's projected, but I need to make some decisions. And that's where you start to say, all right, if I want to get cash flow positive, what do I need to do? What decisions, now that I have this data, where do I get the answers? Well, the answers are found as a transformation of things that you get out of the cash flow statement. So you hear a lot about burn rate, right? Burn rate is the average net cash flow over a period of time. And that lets you know how much you're consuming in a period. So you might see a quarterly burn rate, you might see an annual burn rate, but you're thinking about how much money am I spending in my business on average over a period of time? Let's just say it's a quarter, right? On average, how much do I spend monthly, even though I'm looking at quarterly data to determine that number, right? And that's a very important number because that's once you know that number, then you can, excuse me, start to make decisions to say, hey, if I don't feel good about what my burn rate is, I've now got to back up my expenses, I've got to back up my uses of cash, and I've got to see where can I make some better decisions? Related to burn rate is your runway, right? So people will always talk about what's your runway. Well, your runway is how many periods of burn rate you have, right? How many months of cash flow do you have in the bank? It may be that you don't have any, in which case you've got to go figure out how you're going to raise capital, right? Or get an infusion of cash, however that's going to play out. However, knowing that runway is really important. And this is where obviously people really got hit and businesses really got hit during the pandemic because they didn't have a cash reserve. They didn't have a good runway. And so they didn't understand, wow, I only had three months and this has lasted longer than three months or whatever that looks like. It's also a primary consideration on when to start fundraising. I hear this question all the time. When should I start fund fundraising? Well, you've got to figure out what runway you feel comfortable with. And then you've got to back that up and say, okay, I know that based on my burn rate, I'm going to run out at this point. I'm going to shift that back six months because typically speaking on average, it can take about six months to do your fundraising cycle. That's, that's when I know when I need to start fundraising. And then, okay, how much should I raise? And this is, again, a question I get all the time. Well, you need to look at your cash flow st statement and you need to say, okay, how much money do I need for growth? If I think about I understand my burn rate. I understand what my runway is. I know what growth that I'm looking forward to. If I can look at that number and I can say, hey, I'm looking at my projections. They're all negative. I also want to keep a reserve because that's my kind of peace of mind number. I'm probably going to need to go raise. And it, it gets mathematical at that point. I mean, yes, you can make some decisions beyond it, but if you really truly have a good cash flow projection, how much you're gonna raise is gonna come directly out of your pro forma cash flow statement. And we're gonna to get to that right now. All right. And I know this is an eye chart <laughs> and I know it might be a little bit confusing, but I'm gonna go really slowly. Okay, so you've got your, your pro forma cash flow statement. This is a very, very simplified pro forma cash flow statement. This is in no way as detailed as what I, I normally work on with my clients or what you probably have in your accounting system, whatever, but this is just kind of be very simple to illustrate what you're looking for. Okay, so first of all, one of the things that in most financial models, you're gonna have some kind of color for an input cell, right? You'll see that that cash reserve is yellow. I hope everybody can see that number, but anyway, the number itself doesn't matter. The point is you're going to decide. It's a decision point for you to say, hey, I want three months of reserve. I want six months. I want 12 months. Whatever that looks like for your business, you're going to decide what that is. And then you're going to use that multiple to put a number in that bottle, that, that cell, right? But it's not just, this is the thing that I, that I tell my clients. You're not just putting what you want to be, like I said, your six month runway in there. You also need to think about what number is really gonna give me peace of mind. And that might be more than six months. And that might be a place where you need to make some decisions like, hey, I 
you know, want to get access to some additional funding. I might want a debt line of credit. I might want equity line of credit. I want, I might want something else in that number to give me peace of mind. And that might be something that I never intend to touch, but you need to think about that and you need to be thoughtful when you put that number in that box. Could be just a multiple of runway. It could be something greater than that to give you peace of mind. And I recommend the latter. Okay. So your burn rate, as I mentioned, it's your ending cash balance minus your beginning cash balance, right? That's your net cash. That's how much money you consume in your business. As you can see in this example, things don't look so good. It's negative, And that means that you need to get your race of capital in this business, right? Your runway is your ending cash balance divided by your monthly burn rate, right? That is how much you generally on average consume in a period of time, in this case, a month. Like I mentioned, your cash reserve is your burn rate times however months you, many months you feel comfortable with. Three to six is average. If you wanna have that peace of mind, add three more, add six more, whatever that looks like. How much you should raise? This, again, is mathematical once you have the whole pro forma, pro forma built out. It's literally how much has previously been invested either in the prior period when this model started, you have to decide that yourself. How much is invested? How much your reserve is? Again, you may have peace of mind in that number. It may not just be the multiple of, of your burn rate. Minus your cash low point. You'll also hear the term trough. And that's literally your periodic average low point. So in this case, it happens to be in month two. You don't see the full model here, but this was actually a 12 month projection. Um, it happens to be in month two here. So the cash, the lowest, the most negative point or the lowest cash point in this particular model is that 75, okay? You wanna subtract that. Obviously, if it's a negative number, it's really adding to that number. And that is how much you should raise. And I know that that probably might be a little bit complex. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any questions. might take a minute and I, I like I said Marion I don't see the Q&A so if you see any questions that show up in the Q&A I will pause here I'm keeping no it up I know. Yes. okay awesome okay well I love it oh there's a question from Sharon oh. um, does this include funds for growth or just maintenance so when you're creating your um, your pro forma you should always be projecting whatever your growth picture looks like. So pro forma just means it's not, it's not necessarily real. It should be based on what's really happening in your business, but you're projecting forward, right? So you're not looking backwards, which is what most financial statements do. They look at what already happened. This is actually by default a projection forward. And so it will be projecting growth. Sheena says, can you please go over this one more time? Is it this slide, Sheena, that you wanna see? Like you want me to slowly repeat what I'm talking about here. And let's see, Sharon says, oh yeah, okay, sorry, I saw that. Yes, okay, it's this slide, okay. So on the previous slide, I was talking about all the things that kind of are outputs, the information that's an output of your cash flow statement, right? So you hear the term burn rate, which means how much money you're consuming in a particular period of time, in this case, a month. So the way that you figure that out is you're looking at your cash flow pro forma or a real cash flow statement, and you're saying, hey, I started that calculation at net income, and then I put in numbers for all the money that I spend in my business, both in the operations, which should be you know, the vast majority of the money that you're spending, any kind of financing, meaning long-term long assets that you're purchasing, and then you're investing. So capital contributions, venture capital, you know, kind of those, those, those pieces, right? And all of that, when you figured out that whole statement, is gonna give you an ending cash balance. When you subtract that from your beginning cash balance that was in your account, you're gonna say, all right, th th these are all like the results of your account, right? You're gonna say, oh, in that period, I consumed this much cash. That's my now net cash, right? And then net cash divided by, so, I'm looking at, let's just say I'm looking at a quarter. So I looked at my ending cash balance. I figured out what my net for the quarter was. And there were three months in that quarter. I divide that out. That's now my monthly burn rate. 
that make sense? And again, I'm trying to keep it simple, but if you were looking at a real statement, probably you're always gonna look at things monthly. You're probably gonna evaluate things quarterly, but you're gonna plug all of those numbers into, yeah, okay, got it. All right, so now that you've got your monthly burn rate, that's just your number of, hey, my business consumes X dollars on a monthly basis. Now I know what my burn rate is. That's an important number to know. It's gonna come into everything that you ever decide in terms of conversations with investors, conversations with banks, um, decision making, which we're gonna to get to when we talk about levers, all of those things. You, you probably need to have a good handle on that number. So now your runway is, hey, I knew what my ending cash balance was, right? I know what that is. I'm gonna divide that by my burn rate and say, all right, based on what my, you know, what's sitting in my account right now, I've got two months, I've got five months, I've got seven months, whatever that number is, that's my runway. That's how many more months of cash I have on hand to run my business. And that becomes a clue into when you should be fundraising. If it's, a, if, if it's a projection, you're saying, all right, I'm projecting that in seven months, I'm going to run out of cash. I better start fundraising now because that process could take me six months. That makes sense. Okay. And then just determining what your cash reserve should be, that's where it gets a little bit subjective. You've got to decide, hey, do I want six months on hand or not? If I do, great. If I want more than six because I want to have kind of that peace of mind factor, add more. Sometimes what you might do, and sometimes, like I said, I, what I tell my clients is it's not so much that you're putting your peace of mind number in your reserve. It's just that you know you're never going to let your balance below, go below a certain point, and you're going to take actions to make sure that happens. That doesn't happen. Um, and so once you kind of put all those figures in, so you know how much was previously invested or is coming in or you know sometimes you're looking at i'm waiting for the money sometimes you're looking at i just got the money whatever that looks like or i you know maybe you raised money a year ago you're going to look at that number and say all right I, I raised money a year ago this is the number that i got my business operations played out i probably want to assume i'm going to get at least that much now the next time you know the next round um i want to look at my reserve because that's my comfort level for what I think in terms of runway I need. Then I'm going to look at my low point to say, hey, my low point was really what actually happened, right? I thought I was going to always have 30,000 in the bank. The lowest point in the last six months was that I had 10,000 in the bank. So you put your low point, your trough in that number. And then when you complete that calculation, that tells you comfortably how much you think you should raise. It can be a multiple of that of, of the runway that you put in there just to kind of make sure you feel comfortable. That's going to just be a decision point. It's also going to be a decision point based on whether you actually can raise that much. So there's some squishiness there, but the, the math is relatively simple. And then there's going to be the what happens when you're in conversations with investors. I hope that's I hope that makes sense. Let's see if you are a pre-seed pre-revenue startup is LTV just an estimate. Um, yes, it is. Absolutely. But you should benchmark it. You should, you should look at other companies that are in your competitor set and get a, get a sense for that. Or think about, you know, just what you can find available online in terms of what's a reasonable one for the type of business if you can't get a specific competitor. Okay. I'm looking at the clock. I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to move on. I hope that, hope that was helpful. Okay. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the questions around uses. I'll let you all um, read those in specific, but I want to touch two main points. And one of them is one that I get a lot of times around how much should I spend on marketing? And one of the things that I always say is once you have a good idea of what happens in your marketing engine, so I put a dollar of marketing in and I get $3 out. Once you understand what that picture looks like, whatever your marketing budget is, on average, I would say it should be 25% of revenue if you can do it. If not, no worries, just set your budget. 80% of that money should be spent on what you know works in your engine. Dollar goes in, $3 goes out. I'm gonna spend 80% of my budget on that one dollar category. 20% should be spent on trying out new things new marketing tactic, um, you know, a new marketing tool, whatever that looks like. 20% is for kind of innovation in your marketing. 
80% is a core part of the engine that you know that when you put a dollar in, you get more than a dollar out. Um, the other thing is when you think when you get to a point where you actually truly do understand with relative certainty the cost to acquire a customer and you know what your lifetime value is, you need to compare those two numbers and know that your cost to acquire absolutely has to be less, less than the lifetime value. You'd be surprised how many times I look at data that that's not the case. So those are two kind of core questions that you want to look at when you're thinking about your uses. Okay, so this is a quote from Peter Drucker, no longer with us, but he is, you know, popular as the original management consultant, right? The person who you bring in to say, hey, help me manage the levers in my business, essentially. And he said, entrepreneurs believe that profit is what matters most in a new enterprise, but profit is secondary. Cash flow matters most. And again, he said new enterprise. So I would imagine that people on this call are relatively new if they're not investors themselves. And so think about that critically. Please, 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 if I haven't driven home the point by now, I hope you get it, that cash flow is the most important thing that you need to manage in your business beyond just, you know, kind of the core delivery of your, of your product or service. Okay, so let's talk about levers. What do I mean when I talk about levers and really what are they? Um, levers are the decisions and the actions that you take to improve your cash flow picture. How do you get more positive in your cash flow? You pull levers. And so one of the most important and most useful levers is timing. And at a high level, timing is, if you think about your business and you say, hey, it takes on average 30 days for my customers to pay me, whatever that looks like. Maybe it's um, your payment terms with them. Maybe that's just how they pay. Maybe you break your packages down into chunks and you get paid on a 30 minute, 30 day cycle, whatever that looks like, that's when you're getting your revenue. If that's the case, then you can't have a lot of payables that you pay in 15 days, right? You want to stay cash positive, and the only way to stay cash positive in that example is that you need to have your payables hit on the same cycle as your revenue, right? Simplified example, but just know that whatever you're doing to transform either materials or whatever into a product, you need to stay as positive as possible from that standpoint of, I looked at what my sales days were, I looked at how how money is flowing around and the timing of that. And I wanna make sure that I'm not paying my bills before I get the money in the bank. Timing, key. Um, aside from timing, you wanna think about how am I negotiating? Like, do I need to negotiate better with my vendors? Do I need to do something in terms of changing when I'm making those payables? Do I need to think about um, negotiating other partnerships? Is there some adjacent business that has the attention of the people that I also want to sell to, how can I make a partnership with them? Um, and then allocation. So I mentioned this a little bit with that 80-20 split, but you might have an area of your business where you need to do something innovative and you need to say, hey, how can I allocate a different portion of my budget to that piece of the engine that I know that when I put a dollar in, I get more than a dollar out. Um, and that's something that happens a lot as you grow is making sure you've got the allocations right and you're always going to be looking at what did I do over a period of time? What were my objectives? What were my key results that I was expecting? Did they play out how I expected? If they didn't, then maybe next time I'm changing that allocation. Um, and another thing around um, allocation, especially when you're thinking about your model is I assume I make an assumption on drivers when I'm building a financial model, but when I look back, did those drivers really play out the way I expected? If not, that might mean I need to change my allocations. So again, questions around levers, you are going to get, like I said, all of these questions. Marion's going to give you them all in a one pager, so they're coming. Um, but when you think about the levers, this is where really there can be some kind of difficult conversations and decisions that you need to make. But it's everything from, hey, you know, did I try something that a competitor was doing and I just didn't get traction from it or maybe they are doing some things that are playing out maybe I should go look at those again be very careful about how much of your budget you're allocating to those those innovations 
Um, do I have processes internally that need to be cleaned up, especially if you're about to enter a fundraising cycle? Fundraising can take especially the founder's attention away from the core operations of the business. And so if that is the case, do you have people and processes in place inside your business that can allow you to turn your attention for a period of time that are not going to break down operations and put you in a negative cash flow position? If so, make sure you get those in place before you start that fundraising cycle. Um, and then honestly, do you look at it and say, you know what, I modeled in that we were going to launch this new product or go into this new channel. And when I look at the model, it's not playing out. Maybe you need to delay some of that innovation so that you keep your cash flow picture positive. All right. Ugh, I've got to go fast. Okay, so really quickly, in terms of my recommendations, if they're not clear by now, they should be, is that you should always maintain a rolling three to five year projection for your business. You should regularly update the drivers, the assumptions, what really happened to make sure that your model as close as possible matches what's happening in your business. And then when you're thinking about your cash flow and you're looking at it, you need to look at it frequently. Monthly is good, but weekly is better because the more you know about how cash flows in your business truly on a day-to-day -day basis, the better equipped you will be to make those decisions so you're not surprised when things happen. So again, as I mentioned, make sure you get the, the free gift, which is essentially all those questions in one one pager. Um, and now I want to take your questions. Um, yes, so we have one in the Q&A from Mara. How do you accelerate fundraising if you need money to fund inventory for a la very large potential new customer you are in discussions with? You should be, hopefully you have a, re um, a relationship with a business lender because typically when you need to ramp up cash flow to meet the needs of, you know, an engagement that you have, the fastest way to do that is with some sort of line of credit and you're going to get that from a lender not a venture capitalist okay um and then will these slides be available after this meeting the slides will not but we have a one pager that camille will be sharing with us um and then so we have two minutes but leslie says what about clients paying up front versus spreading out a contract over time. How hard should I push back? Even if the product um, I deliver occurs, occurs over time with monthly, quarterly deliverables. Wait, say that again, sorry. I wanna make sure. Um, what about clients paying up front versus spreading out a contract over time? How hard should I push back? So if they're gonna pay up front, then you need to have the wherewithal to not spend ahead, right? Because if you're going to get a lump sum and then you've got to deliver something over time, you've got to be very, very diligent about holding that cash in reserve for matching it up for when you're actually delivering whatever it is that you're delivering. Um, if you're concerned that you don't have the right type of client and maybe that pay up front is just the nature of not having the right type of client, then you need to kind of think about, all right, how can I keep the lights on and serve them, the ones that I'm serving that are paying me up front, and then go out and deploy either sales reps or your own resources or your own time to hit that sweet spot of your market that's going to pay on the cycle that you want. It's hard to kind of answer that without knowing your business, but that's what I'm thinking. You know, as much as possible, be very diligent about managing your cash to, to, uh, to um, address the upfront payment but then also, you know, try to hit that target market that you really want to hit. All right. We are at time. We do see some questions. Yeah. So but I do have one more slide, which is literally like, first of all, thank you for your time. I know that you, as a, as a founder of a business, you're, you're very busy. I appreciate that time. If there's something that I can help you with, I know I didn't get to all of the questions. Hit me up on LinkedIn, um, visit my website. But again, I just want you all to know that I want as many businesses founded by females to thrive as possible. And if I can do my part in that, I am happy to. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Camille, for joining us today. I just sent out the research page in the chat, um, but we will be sending out a feedback survey 
So please, please fill it out. Let us know what else you would love to see. Um, we, we really do take into consideration what you all um, share with us. But thank you again, Camille, for your time. This was such a great session. Um, we will have everything posted up on the All Raise website. So you can find resources there and the recording of this as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. And thank you again, Camille. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.